I want to welcome folks who are just joining us. Um, we are uh, proud to have um, two of the Chancellor's Fellows with us to talk about Equity 2030, Academic Equity and Culturally Responsive Teaching for uh, one of our Maverick Diversity Institute sessions. I want to uh, remind folks that the Maverick Diversity Institute offers a wide range of programming. Our next event will be uh, with Andratisha Fritz-Gerald, uh, where she'll present on anti-racism and universal design during the Pan-African Conference. So if you haven't registered for that, I will put some info in the chat towards the end of our session. But I want to thank you all for joining. The Diversity Institute is an opportunity to engage in conversations um, around equity on our uh, Mankato campus and the ways that we can improve our services or enhance our own learning to better serve our students and colleagues. So again, um, welcome. And I am delighted to introduce Dr. Kim and Dr. Panniker, who are um, Chancellor's Fellows who focus on the Equity 2030 Initiative, which we are all becoming um, much more aware of and, and interacting with on various levels in our departments and divisions. Um, Dr. Kim is a faculty member in the Department of Philosophy at Minneapolis College. She served as a Chancellor's Fellow in Academic Equity Strategy for the Minnesota State System with the aim to eliminate equity gaps in state colleges and universities by 2030. And Dr. Panniker serves as Interim Dean of the College of Community Studies and Public Affairs at Metropolitan State University in St. Paul. And he also holds the position of Professor of Sociology at St. Cloud State University. Previously, while at St. Cloud State, Dr. Panniker Dr. Panniker served as Director of Graduate Programs and Social Responsibility. So thank you all again so much uh, for being with us and I will turn it over to you. Thank you Liz so much for this introduction and the generous offering of your time, especially during these very Zoom weary days. So. Um, Aja and I just first of all want to extend our thanks to you and to the Minnesota State Mankato community. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you all. Let me go back here. And maybe just quickly give me a thumbs up reaction if you can see the presentation. Um, Perfect, great, then we're in good shape. So my name is Ruthann Crapo Kim. Again, I'm a faculty member at Minneapolis College. I'm currently on leave this academic year uh, at the Pennsylvania State University Philosophy's department, working as a Just Transformation Fellows, um, Mellon, uh, getting to write a book on Caribbean philosophy. So if you wanna talk about that afterward, I'd love to uh, share more. But let me just jump into our conversation for today. Our learning outcomes that we sent to Liz way back, I think a couple months ago, are the following. That today we wanna to be able to analyze the present strategies for mitigating and eliminating academic equity gaps among our targeted students. Second, we wanna be able to evaluate these strategies and what does it mean to close academic equity gaps um, from across the nation among Minnesota State sister institutions with particular focus on race conscious inquiry, culturally relevant pedagogy, and also anti-racist uh, pedagogy, which I'm excited to hear that your next institute will be fo focusing on. And then we also wanna use self-reflection to analyze assumptions, underlying pedagogical approaches, and shift from deficit approaches to asset-based approaches. And part of that shift that I always wanna like embed in everything that we do is to use humor and silliness um, so this is why I have this little image here to the right that I wonder if my plants know that they are black. And I have stock images and references to them from a number of diverse image stock groups that if you are looking to diversify your presentations, um, you can find those resources at the end of the presentation. I also want to say that it's not just important that we present on equity, but that how we present models equity. So some of the things that we're gonna to do today is we're going to ask you to foreground 
how white consciousness is already permeating the conversation that we're going to have. And white consciousness gives us expectations of either or thinking. It often makes us feel defensive. It's going to have a tremendous trust of the written versus the oral word. There's going to be a sense of paternalism, particularly about our students that might erupt. We're going to have to combat power hoarding, individualism, our implicit comfort with predominantly white groups, even if you're a person of color, that might be true. And we're going to have to think about timelines that perpetuate rights, a white supremacy culture. When that kind of rub comes up in our lives, we often have difficulty integrating our brain because a lot of the work that we do in universities is what we would call in psychology left brain prefrontal work. It's work where we make lists. It's work where we have language. It's work where we like linear progress. But for many people in communities of color who are experiencing trauma, they are in the what we call the barking dog. And the barking dog, if we think about this, I don't know if you all have seen this illustration of the brain and the hand, but if we think of our thumb as the limbic part of your brain and then wrap our fingers around that, we have the cortex. Sometimes we call this the upstairs brain, the downstairs brain. But when we explain this to children, we often say that when you are in places of emotional uh, agitation, distress, fight or flight, your dog is barking. And when the dog barks, the owl flies away. Meaning that for many people who are just even in this meeting, talking about these things is gonna cause their owl to fly away. So one of the things that we have to do is figure out a way to reintegrate the brain, the body with the mind. And that often comes through mindfulness practices. Something that I like to do and I encourage you all to do at the beginning of meetings, um, I do this at the beginning of every teaching session, is just offer my students a mindfulness practice that can help reintegrate the fibers of the cortex back into that limbic structure. Um, so mindfulness is then gives us the ability to notice the gap and to see the distance between what's happening around us and then before we react to suspend judgment. It also gives us a chance to offer ourselves kindness and compassion, which is something that we're going to need a lot as we continue on in this pandemic. And finally, the th fourth thing I just want us to be aware of is what is your epistemic lane? As we come into this conversation, not all of us come with the same kind of on-ramp. And so I just want to differentiate these three on-ramps. The first one I would call lived experience. That means that when we talk about equity gaps, race, first generation trauma, what it means to be excluded because of poverty and the combination of racism, other intersecting identities, this is not a thought experiment for you, but this is your body is at stake. Your very livelihood is at stake. Your body is being pulled over on a regular basis, possibly by police. Uh, this is coming into your neighborhood. The second group of people are going to be ones that we call intimate experience. It might not be happening to you, but it's happening to your intimate others. So this could be your partner. This could be your grandchildren. It's coming into your space that you try to keep away from the public space, and it means that you have to deal with it in your off hours. For the fourth group, this is not your lived experience. It doesn't come into your intimate space, but something that you're curious, you want to know about, and that's where you are today. When we have discussions, I would like to hear the most from those who have lived experience, a medium amount from those who have intimate experience, and then I would like those who have learned experience to really create space for the other two groups to be the consultants in the work that we're going to do today. Um, quickly, Liz gave me access to the Maverick Academic Equity Gaps, and I'm assuming that a lot of you have seen these data. I have put them in the chat. So I know with Zoom, sometimes if people come late, you have to like repopulate that in. And Liz, if you could help me download those, put those back in the chat again. But your data to me is very interesting. And it's showing a trend that while your equity gaps are going down, if you disaggregate those data and you look particularly at your Native American community, which is much smaller, uh, disproportionate to the population of indigenous people here in the state of Minnesota, um, that seems to be a flag for me. And then if we look at your largest two ethnic groups, your African-American and your Latinx populations, they're struggling. 
And so again, looking at those disaggregated data is really important. In this graph, we can see that there's a difference between the status of your international students versus your domestic students of color. Um, and so again, looking at those data will be important for you to understand the nuances and the distinctions, not to make conclusions, but to start to ask yourself questions. Uh, this is my last slide before Ajay jumps in, but we want to make sure that we are sharing language. And so today, when we use the word anti-racist and what does it mean to be an anti-racist educator, uh, we're using this definition from the Center for Anti-Racist Education, um, and you can see it here. And so I will let this kind of soak in and then we'll pivot to Ajay next. Okay, I'm gonna move to the next slide. Ashe, tell us a little bit more about academic equity. Sure, um, thanks, Ruthann. Um, in our work as fellows, one of the first things that we decided was that we're gonna uh, call our work by a name. And that name that we came up with was academic equity. And we wanted to make sure that, you know, we tried our best uh, to put this out there all across the system. So people started to use this concept consistently and the lack of it, of course, as academic inequity to refer to something very specific. So um, now, of course, uh, this concept was developed from a more foundational concept of equity itself. And so the picture that we have here is uh, quite illustrative. Um, now, you may, almost all of you may be familiar with the concepts that are being discussed here. Um, while equality is defined with reference to opportunities and treatment, equity is defined with refer reference to outcomes. If in this context, watching the game is the outcome, and equity here means everyone being able to watch the game, then unequal treatment is required for equal outcomes. So as an academic institution, or as academic institutions that we are all part of, students come to us in pursuit of their academic goals. So the outcome that they're seeking is academic goals. Academic equity then is about our ability to provide differential opportunities based on students' diverse backgrounds, levels of preparation, et cetera, so that they can all succeed. And so that's, in a nutshell, the concept of academic equity. It, this is not a new uh, concept, certainly not a new term. We invented um, uh, many scholars, especially Estella Ben Simon and others from the uh, Center for Urban Education have used this term. We sort of modified it to suit our work uh, in specific ways. Move the next slide, please. So in speaking a little bit about our, our fellow's work, <clears throat> our charge was to address uh, the persistent opportunities, opp opportunity gaps um, leading to what's been termed the educational debt that our institutions, that's colleges and universities owe to communities of color, poorer sections of the society, uh, and those whose families haven't had the opportunity of generational education or generational educational opportunities. Now this effort came from the acknowledgement that for a long time, Minnesota has been known as an educational state, but despite that, we have persistently bad, uh, it, what, came to be called achievement gaps, and later on as opportunity gaps, and more recently as educational debt. Now, and, and the gaps are specifically between white students, middle-class students, and students with parents who have had access to higher education as groups of comparison with students of color, poorer and first-generation students. So uh, we, as I mentioned earlier, we decided to use the term academic inequity to, to refer to this situation. Now, while looking at the existing practices that contribute to academic inequities within our institutions, in which these particular types of uh, groups of students that we just mentioned, low income, first generation and students of color, they fail disproportionately, we realize that our work or our recommendations have to really straddle different areas, all the way from the classroom, where there is the direct interaction that takes place between the faculty member and the students, 
or advising where an advisor, faculty, or professional interacts directly with, with students or interaction of staff with students, et cetera, the micro level interaction to, to, the, to the institution uh, at large, the university or the college within which this interaction takes place, all the way to the system, a collection of similarly situated uh, institutions uh, with a with, with common, fairly common charge. Now, if we are to straddle all these different levels, we decided that we should use a, use a consistent language there as well. Uh, we agreed upon the concept of scales, a geographic concept that we borrowed, and we started to think about the, the system as a macro layer, uh, the institution as the meso layer with its own uniqueness or their own uniquenesses. And of course, the, the, the space of direct interaction where university representatives, be they faculty, staff, ad administrators, advisors, et cetera, how they interact directly with students impacting their educational journeys while they're with us. So we call them the micro level. But to be sure, all of these, all of these scales, the scalar units that we demarcated are surely very much interrelated. They're not, they don't exist by themselves. Of course, we call them nested layers, so to speak, in a way, because one influences the other in numerous different ways that we all know about. Now, um, one example is that, you know, if an institution at the meso level sets academic equity as a, a priority goal to pursue, then it may initiate policies and practices that reflect within micro levels, that's within a classroom uh, setting or within the realm of interaction between uh, an advisor and their students. So uh, we focused, Ruthann and I focused on the academic equity strategy section of the fellows report. And that, that uh, you know, uh, part, that part of the report focused largely on very generalized sets of recommendations by virtue of the fact that we were addressing questions across 37 institutions, but now it's sort of whittled down a, you know, a few to about 30 some institutions that we have within the system overall. Um, and as we, you know, as this work advanced, and as we moved on from our fellows uh, work into, into our own you know, respective realms of activity, we stayed in touch and we also realized that there is much more to be done. And one of the areas where that much more to be done really could materialize was within the classroom. So uh, we, you know, during the fellows report, we did learn a lot from various signposts within the, uh, within the system settings where individuals have been working uh, to advance uh, academic equity in numerous ways. And they've been sharing their learnings and knowledge with others, including us, we've been beneficiaries of those. So we decided that part of our presentation really today should focus on that micro aspect, which is the classroom, uh, which is really where a lot of uh, significant impacts on uh, student experiences uh, take, take place. With our next slide, please. So we are we built in a few commonly held assumptions about about our class you know, that we hold, particularly if you're thinking about ourselves as faculty uh, within our classrooms. Now, we you know we've I've heard uh, folks talk about how the student body has been changing over the years, um, even. You know, a few months back, I had a chair of one of our departments talk to me about, you know, bemoaning the fact that there is a substantial change in the, in the kind of students that we are able to attract. And that, folk, I mean, you know, the focus there was really on low skills in reading, comprehension, writing, math, et cetera, which of course, then by extension, the assumption was that they were not ready for college. So we call that deficit thinking. The focus here is really on our students' deficits we are not really ready to focus on the assets that they bring. That's number one. Number two, uh, we think about our students as receptacles of knowledge. So we, have, we are sort of, uh, you know, we are dispensers of knowledge in this particular situation, rightly so because of the fact that, you know, people have done 
uh, you know, engaged in years of gathering um, information, processing them into knowledge, and they they think about their classroom as an arena where the transfer of knowledge should take place. Um, so the question then oftentimes asked is, we as faculty have a certain amount of content to deliver to students in our courses. And therefore we don't have the time or scope within uh, a college level course to help develop basic skills if students don't already have those. So that we call that content constraint. We also, I also wanna point out really quickly that that content constraint perception of a classroom also assumes that the main intent or the main goal of a classroom is really this transfer of knowledge and that the students are receivers of knowledge and the faculty are dispensers in this context. And then finally, pursuit of excellence. And many of us pride in the statement that my courses are often tough because uh, I, had, I set high standards in my courses and do not compromise on my expectations from students. All of these, you know, in some way or the other, one way or the other, really um, permeate most of our, our thinking about uh, the process of education and also really have impact on how we go ahead and, and practice what we do within classrooms. So the, uh, Pultan, if you wanna to move to the next slide, please. So when we point out that when an institution uh, is characterized by a predominance of academic practices based on those assumptions, then we start to see, or we see that within that institution, uh, there is a, an ever increasing form, I mean, ever, there are ever increasing forms of academic inequity. So in other words, academic inequity starts to become more and more characteristic of such institutions. So then we started to think about ways to focus really on institutional academic equity itself. So as I pointed out earlier, there's different language achievement gap versus opportunity gaps versus educational debt uh, that's often used. The key point is really the, uh, the fact that our students that, that come to us based upon their backgrounds, the color of their skins, the, uh, whether their you know, parents were able to have the good fortune of higher education or not, uh, or whether they come from middle class or, or low income backgrounds, end up actually having differential impacts. And those consolidate over time into very measurable criteria, very measurable uh, metrics that we can see as to who succeeds and who doesn't within as, as they walk through um, the corridors of our institutions. So uh, we, of course, would like to encourage Mavericks uh, to focus on the institutional debt uh, or institutional educational debt. In what, I, what we mean by that is that if we say, if we take as an institution some degree of responsibility, for these differential outcomes, then we are training our lenses more on us and our practices and policies than on the students. So that you know, brings us to two important points that we'd like to discuss. And we think that you know, academic, academically equitable institutions must commit to at least these two, if not more. First is student readiness and the other is inclusive excellence. Moving forward, Putin. I think this is your slide. Yeah, so in the chat, we'd like you to list the expectations we typically have of students coming into our institutions. I'll let you all do that while I go through just a few bullet points here. So Ajay alluded to, we know that student demographics are changing. Doris Hill, who was our metrics person, one of the other of, of the four fellows, uh, she was looking particularly county by county and as far as we can tell in the next decade, there will not be enough white students in our state to leverage or to even keep enrollment, not, you know, not even to mention retainment at the current levels that they are. So we're going to see a massive enrollment decline if we do not figure out ways to really work with communities of color. Um, again, we wanna move away from deficit language and what's happening is we're missing an analysis of institutions that they've come through that have labeled our students unprepared. Um, there is an increasing segment of students nationally uh, who are coming from these underprepared institutions. Uh, again, these are ones that we have systemically created an inequity. 
And it is widely acknowledged that the segregated school system fails disproportionately and that higher education is complicit in this. So this trend is going to continue. And so what is a public comprehensive, the fourth largest system in the nation responsible for doing about the aforementioned debt? So uh, about inclusive excellence. Now, we, since we mentioned pursuit of excellence as really one of the goals that oftentimes we, we hear from faculty as a barrier to pursuit of academic uh, equity, we are making an effort here to really balance the two. And I, I think the concept that we can embrace in pursuit of excellence for all is really inclusive excellence. Now, we've heard uh, many folks talk about uh, the call for inclusion or equity as one that is also implicitly calling for watering down content or reducing the rigor of the courses. I haven't seen any scholar of academic equity asking professors not to pursue ex excellence in favor of equity and inclusion. In fact, having lower expectations of students from the above mentioned backgrounds, which is students of color, first generation students and low income students would be racism or classism of lower expectations. The key question is how can we set high standards and help all of our students achieve those? How, ca how can we set high standards and help all of our students achieve those? And th therein we are actually taking the concept of excellence literally not just for a few who are probably already endowed, trained, prepared sufficiently to achieve, pursue and achieve excellence for all. Now that then puts a lot of responsibility on us. If we adopt that question as, our, as one that guides our practice, it also places some amount of responsibility on us. Now, what are some of those responsibilities? I guess it's the next slide about. Well, a question to ask ourselves then is, if we really thought about the, we oftentimes take pride in the success of our succeeding students, I mean, successful students. Now, when do we, do we really have as much of, do we, are we, do we feel so sad similarly about those that do not succeed? And if we ask ourselves that question, we are asking a question about responsibility primarily. If we claim responsibility for somebody's success, we should also be willing to claim responsibility for the failure of others. And if we, if we do that, then the question is, what is in our teaching that helps some, some succeed while cause others to fail? And we are training, we are turning the lens around to, to make it focus on us, our work, our teaching. Of course, it's not always, easy, it's not always palatable, but nonetheless, that's an extremely important component of what it really means to be an academically uh, equitable institution. Now, we know that most doctoral institutions or doctoral programs do not provide substantial amount of training in instructional instruction generally, let alone equitable pedagogies or equi equitable forms of teaching. Um, so as such, the system is set up in a way that we train content experts without, who oftentimes go on to become professors without really also sufficiently equip, equipping them with the ability to be good instructors uh, as, as they move on to become teachers. So the question then for us, and particularly for, for Mankato, is as a comprehensive institution, one that is one that you know grew up. I mean, over over the last century and a half plus, as a teaching institution, do we pay sufficient attention to faculty's instructional skills, particularly those focusing on advancing academic equity? It's a question worth considering at the meso level, as we think about making changes at the micro level. So. Um, 
as we are moving to wind down our presentation in the next few slides, I, we would like to offer a couple of different sets of strategies uh, to approach academic equity work specifically within classrooms. But please know that while we are talking, we are emphasizing this inside classroom work, we also acknowledge with all humility that most of our, uh, you know, our participants in this, um, in, in this discussion today are not faculty and therefore, please take these ideas and think about how those might be applicable to your spheres of work uh, if you're not faculty. Um, the first is really the idea of cultural humility. Cultural humility uh, really calls upon us to be a little bit self-reflective um, about who we are, our positionality within the larger social structures, within from which, you know, which also provide lived experience, you know, context for lived experiences of our students. Think, you know, commitment to reflecting about those and also committing commitment to reflecting about our pedagogical practices as intimately connected to the overall social structures within which we are embedded. And that might help increase some amount of self-awareness as a professor. So that's, that's uh, the first point. Another key thing, and that's, this is something that, of course, we talk about in different ways, but my uh, former colleague and, and dear friend, uh, Timothy Berry, who's you know, one of the Mavericks, uh, talks about this as a humanist approach. Commitment to seeing, well, whoever you interact with as whole persons, acknowledging their humanity. Particularly in this case, of course, we're talking about students. And thinking about individuals as whole persons also behooves us really to think of, acknowledge the fact that they're also, and we are too, not just them, cultural beings. And our, you know, and our cultural being, my cultural being, may differ from another one's another person's cultural, no, cultural being. And acknowledgement of that difference then means that there must be a commitment to interactive learning from each other so that there can be common spaces established. Now, of course, that all of those then lead to a willingness to suspend judgments. Now, we, in, in, you know, we're talking about a situation nationally where uh, culture really has become a, a fraught uh, discussion point uh, where judgments are made. But if we are really to meaningfully impact people's lives, so we are able to contribute to their success, this I think is an extremely important component of that recipe, which is to suspend judgment. And we talked about some of those things up front because oftentimes people ask this question, now you're, you're asking us to engage in culturally responsive pedagogy. Now tell us some practices, some ideas that we can take from, uh, you know, from you and, and, and employ those within our classrooms. Let me say that there is no such set parameters of how you would employ cultural, culturally responsive pedagogy. So in other words, there are no set practices of what it means to be culturally responsive there are some pointers. There are some general ideas. There are some theories or some concepts that, that can guide our behavior. Now, first of all, let me actually stay, uh, say, that, say that it is not about cult being culturally responsive in pedagogy, in advising, in, in interaction, is not, does not tantamount to expecting everyone to learn everything about every culture. Humanly impossible. And, and also a recipe for no action. Um, and that's where combining this idea with the commitment to cultural humility will prepare us well enough to be ready for culturally responsive pedagogy at whatever level of learning one, one has. So th that said, the uh, second point here is to me most important, which is an idea that I, I, you know, we borrowed from Zaretta Hammond's uh, famous book, Culturally Responsive Teaching and the Brain. She talks about the work, the work of culturally responsive pedagogy as one of helping the transformation of people who are deemed de dependent learners to become independent learners. 
Now, there is a, a much more elaborate discussion of this process of moving you know, individuals from, from being dependent learners to independent learners in that particular book. I would not really go into that because it would really take a whole lot of our, our, our discussion time today. So uh, I will just say that for uh, various reasons based on uh, you know, educational segregation or segregated schools and so on and so forth, uh, and, and you know those the teachers within those schools, oftentimes um, grading behavior rather than outcomes and competencies. Students really balk at the idea of being in such classrooms, thereby not being sufficiently prepared to come to higher education institutions. Which is why when they when they actually do enroll in an undergraduate uh, program, they're deemed dependent learners. Now, how do we actually help them on their journey to becoming independent learners who, whose work, whose abilities are actually at the highest levels of what we call Bloom's taxonomy? Now, there are some, some, some pointers that we could really uh, talk about. Um, <clears throat> I guess part of this work has to really think about pedagogical strategies um, aimed at building a classroom environment that wherein the students actually experience what could be called a safe space to express themselves freely without fear, without having to hide themselves. And finally, the last point is that as Hammond uh, points out, if the culture is, of the classroom is one that they cannot relate to, and therefore not one that they feel comfortable in, the fight or flight mechanisms of the brain are triggered that results oftentimes without volition, the student shutting off and therefore not learning very little from the class. So some of the ideas that we have listed here are, you know, present your authentic self, uh, think about a classroom as a, a space for partnership, learn, as, learn about your students as you teach them, trust their ability to learn in a conducive learning environment. Who that? We just want to leave you with a graph that was created by our friend and colleague Kiyosho Kishimoto, who is at St. Cloud State University, uh, one of the teachers at the RPAC Anti-Racist Pedagogy Across the Curriculum Institute. And Kyoko has, I think, really helpfully differentiated out for us what is how does CRP fit into the structure of all of the other kinds of diversity work that we hear about. So on this chart, we might think of the upper quadrant as being individual and the lower quadrant being systemic or structural change. And that's really at the level of structure where equity is at. When we think of diversity, inclusion, excellence, we think of that being at the individual stage. Um, when we think about the kinds of things that have happened uh, earlier in equity work, multicultural is a, uh, education, this is a lot of what happens in the business world, cultural competency, cultural um, proficiency, even the IDI, these are to help people at the individual level. Culturally responsive pedagogy is getting closer, and we would probably put cultural humility right here as a gateway for moving from here to here from the cultural competency into actual cultural uh, responsiveness. In order to get to structures, you need a kind of structural format, which we would argue that anti-racist, race conscious inquiry really pushes us toward. And so this is, again, the part where we're just focusing on students over here, here we're focusing on faculty, here we're focusing on faculty with students. And so this is where we want to get to on our quadrant with equity. And so you're going to hear us use some of these words are not interchangeable. We just want to start to differentiate what those terms might mean and where you are at on this map. Um, are you starting at the individual quadrant? And again, there's nothing negative about any of these points, but where is it that you want to end up? Um, what are some walkaways that we hope that people will get to experience? Uh, first of all, we have some ask the faculty. We hope that you are, and we, we trust that the Mavericks are having opportunity to learn about CRP, um, anti-racist pedagogy, uh, race conscious inquiry, the, all those acronyms. We hope that there is an active culture of adopting cultural humility, that you are examining racist policy and practices in your courses and also in your academic standards. 
So for one of the things that we're doing at Minneapolis College is we are examining our late policy across the board. And we're also looking at things like withdrawal policy, late policy, how these things have negative impacts disproportionately on students of color. Um, we're, look, we're also looking at grading policies using a four point versus other grading systems and how that can also affect inequity. Um, we have asks of administrators to support the work of academic equity to support the establishment by support we mean like time and money and the number one thing that our faculty have asked for more than anything is time the establishment of peer learning communities that means duty days release credits support the disaggregation of data i heard uh, various comments on the chat some of you have never seen these data some of you have have and you've even gotten to hear them in context I would argue that we haven't heard them in context and here unless we hear these data from the students who are reflected and absent in the data. So that to me is the most important critical point is are we actually looking at these data with the students who are missing. Recognize promote and celebrate academic equity work um, again promote. And then make academic equity work a routine expectation. So we would like to now spend the last uh, 15 minutes and we'll wrap this up at 556 and I don't know Liz if you have the ability to make. Um, breakout rooms, but we would like to have breakout rooms with five people per room and what can happen is you can take any of these questions and any person in the room can answer one of these questions. Uh, the living room conversations, if you've ever used those, use a very similar format, meaning all questions are available to you. Pick the one that is speaking to you, calling you in, and spend some time with your five, uh, four other peers, so there'll be five of you in the group, answering one of these questions. All right, unfortunately, we don't have time to hear all the amazing things that you learn from one another in your breakout sessions. So if each of you could just, in the chat before you leave, write down one thing that you're gonna that stuck with you uh, what is a sticky moment that you had in the breakout session that you think ah this i'm gonna hang on to and again we're modeling that the real help the real resource doesn't come from bringing in external experts it comes from having opportunity time with those who are in the work with us our colleagues uh, particularly that breaking down of division between faculty and staff, um, how we can bring in our students, graduate students, their expertise. I think I saw Alex in here and I just want to give a shout out to Alex. I think Alex and I worked on the goal seven language over this last year and they were amazing. Um, so again, in the chat, what you've learned. Ajay, I'll give you the last word. Um, well, I'll just, uh, you know, say that, uh, express my deep sense of gratitude to the Maverick Diversity Institute and everyone who's attended here today for this opportunity to share some of our thoughts with you. We know that there is a lot of work going on within Mankato. Um, in fact, during our time as fellows, uh, we were beneficiaries of, uh, by virtue of sharing knowledge uh, of some of the, some of the work that uh, V.B. Morris and, and his team's been doing. Uh, within the equity and inclusion space, particularly as it pertains to academic equity work. So a shout out to, to some of the good work that's going on in Mankato. I truly appreciate this opportunity and hopefully uh, this was useful to you all and to, of course, our students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all the students who've taught us. Thank you so much to both of you. Uh, and might I just encourage folks uh, please do stay in contact with the Maverick Diversity Institute. Um, if there are speakers you have uh, to recommend, I know that came up in our little uh, group, are ways that we can help uh, bring information to you that supports your work in creating a more equitable space in Mankato. We're happy to do it. So thank you all so much. And thank you so much to our speakers. Uh, we really appreciate your time and, and knowledge today.